Hello and welcome to another Wild Food UK video. Uh, it's uh, the 2nd of July I think today and uh, this video is going to be made up of some little shorts that I've done today and uh, over the last couple of weeks. So all the mushrooms in this video are your kind of June, July, summer mushrooms and for me the king of those mushrooms is this one down here which is why I am clinging on to the side of a cliff <laughs> to pick them. Here's our chanterelles, Cantharellus sibarius. Just briefly, if you've not watched all my other videos on the uh, chanterelle, it's uh, featured in a few, and one where I just talk about the chanterelle for a good five or six minutes. Um, but the simple ID features are we have full skills, and uh, when you cut them in half, the flesh of our lovely yellow chanterelles is pure white. And the best thing about them is that even when you've got older ones which have been a bit nibbled on the outside, like this one here, these mushrooms do not get maggoty because they contain an insecticide which puts off the flies. So you can leave your chanterelles until they're more mature than most other mushrooms. This one here, nice and yellow. Oh, got a nice long stem. Nice and yellow and fresh, but very munched on the outside. <sighs> Doesn't bother me. I'm just gonna take off the mud and I'm gonna collect fair few of these today and then I'm going to take them home and uh, make some pickled chanterelles which I'll show you in this video. These ones actually are probably just ever so slightly or just a tiny bit bigger than I would like for my pickled chanterelles. They'll work exactly the same but um, the little younger versions, not quite as young as these little buttons here. But mushrooms of about, say, this size and bigger, with your chanterelles, they're perfect for, or well, that's the perfect size for pickling. So I'm gonna pick a few of these, leave a few behind, and show you some more mushrooms on my way along the cliffside. There you go. We smelt this one a little way before we found it. And you can see the flies have as well. Around this side, it's still got all that black, stinky covering on. <laughs> all that black stuff is uh, what the um, mushroom creates with its spores in for the flies to come and land on it because it smells like rotten flesh. Um, and then the flies take those spores away, land somewhere else. This is our stinkhorn, Phallus impudicus, and uh, it is classed as an edible mushroom. And in one of my more silly videos from a couple of years ago, you can see me eating it in the egg stage, uh, which is when it's apparently considered a bit of a delicacy in certain parts of Europe, but it's not one that's going in my foraging bag today. There is another one over there as well. Stunted little stinkhorns. <laughs> Normally they get uh, much taller than this. There's the egg that it's grown from. We also get the dog stinkhorn. Oh God, there's another one. It is a bit of a smelly patch around here. And we do get the dog stinkhorn in these woods as well. It's just a, a smaller version of this. There are some really crazy looking stinkhorns too. The uh, octopus stinkhorn, I've done a video on that. And there's uh, birdcage fungus as well. And uh, they are amazing to look at. There's some good time-lapse photography of birdcage fungus on YouTube. I reckon you'd all enjoy watching that. But these aren't going in my bag. <laughs> 
this is turning into a bit of an extreme foraging day. Um, my chanterelle spots along this area all seem to be on the side of this cliff. And then as we were walking along, Lindsay spotted this beauty sticking out of this old dead tree. Another one of our favorite June mushrooms. It goes through June and July and you can often get it in reasonable condition in August, but it's a mushroom that you really do want. Unlike the chanterelles, this is a mushroom you do want when it's young. And this is just that it's kind of perfect stage for me. Some of it is. Some of these fronds might be a little bit too tough, but certainly these young ones up the top. I'm just going to use, I'll show you what I use for foraging is this tiny little pocket knife. It's actually a key ring knife with a, a couple of maybe an inch and a half's worth of blade. I mention this because uh, in one of my videos um, a couple of videos ago I was using my Opinel knife, the one with the curvy mushroom blade and uh, a lot of people and a brush on the back and uh, a lot of people commented on that video saying that's an illegal knife and you shouldn't be using it in public. Um, that's true apart from the fact that I am a professional forager so when I come out foraging I'm at work so I'm allowed to use that knife but normally I just have this knife which is perfectly legal it's a little Leatherman Micro or Micra yeah Leatherman Micra and that's all the blade that I need even to get through the biggest mushrooms that that I find so chicken of the woods here this is going to be one of the bigger mushrooms that I'll have to cut through and that tiny little blade is big enough and the benefit of this thing is that it's always on my key ring wherever I go because I'm kind of always foraging wherever I am and when you get into foraging that's that's kind of how it is so having stuff readily available on your key ring like my little magnifier here and my belt bag always on me instead of a basket means that I'm always ready to go foraging I do when I know I'm going to be picking loads of stuff I'll take out a basket and you know that's uh, that's fine but there's to me, not much more annoying than walking around the woods for an hour or so with an empty basket. These belt bags, which we do sell, this isn't an advert, but these belt bags, um, they, they sit on your belt and they're of no obstruction to you whatsoever until you find something and you open them out, put your mushrooms or your plants in them and then you've got your hands free, which uh, today, considering the extreme foraging, that I'm doing <laughs> is a handy thing. Anyway, back onto the mushroom. Here is a perfect, just do a little walk the plank, <laughs> a perfect young frond of chicken of the woods. Lightyporus sulfurius and as uh, I went vegetarian about uh, two years ago and uh, because of that this is a mushroom that I really look forward to every year because it's called chicken of the woods for a reason it has the texture of chicken I'll just show you that sort of almost fibrous firm texture of a lovely chicken breast and uh, when you cook it, it's got a flavour much like chicken. And it also takes on marinades just like chicken does. So this is something that I use um, as often as I can nowadays in my curries and my stir fries and chicken and mushroom pies or mushroom and mushroom pies, I suppose, if you like. Um, because it is, as far as I'm concerned, the best substitute for chicken that you'll get. And that includes all of the meat substitutes that you get in the shops as well. So chicken of the woods, easy to ID. It's the only mushroom that will be soft and flexible like that with this coloring growing out of uh, normally from waist height upwards on any dead or dying tree. Um, uh, if you're picking from around the base of a tree, something that looks like this, it's probably the Meripolis giganteus. Um, young, young specimens of that mushroom do look quite a lot like young specimens of chicken of the woods, um, but that mushroom's edible, so not really a problem. Um, but as long as you're picking from kind of waist height upwards and it's yellow and 
flexible, succulent in texture, then there's nothing else it can be apart from chicken of the woods in the UK. So it's a really safe mushroom to ID, but it does have a little caveat in that some people have a nasty reaction to it. So they'll get gastric upset, which nobody wants, obviously. Um, and I've also heard that one of the side effects of the, the reactions that, that people get to chicken of the woods is that their lips will swell up and you'll get a kind of numbness in your mouth. Um, Neither of those things you want from a dinner. So uh, the first time you eat chicken in the woods, eat a small portion, wait 24 hours, then maybe try a bit more, wait another 24 hours. And if you have any tummy gurgling, um, then it's probably best that you, you don't eat any more. And certainly don't just feed this to a, a bunch of guests at dinner um, because it might be that one of them has a, a nasty night because of it, but once you've um, ascertained that you're one of the people that can eat this mushroom, it's a treat, it's a real delight. It is, as I say, my favorite chicken substitute now that I'm one of those vegetarian types. So I'm gonna pick a little bit more of this and leave some of it to grow because the more chicken of the woods around, the better as far as I'm concerned. Tight rope walk back to it now. Here we've got another lovely, lovely mushroom, I hope. It's in that family, the Russulas. I'll just get onto some safe flat ground. <laughs> Russulas, you can tell by their stout white stem, which will snap like a piece of chalk. And their gills, which on almost the entire family are brittle. So let's have a little look. Oh, let's just check a bit more. No, no brittle snapping of the gills on this mushroom. So I'll just have a little nibble. And it tastes lovely. Um, which means that I've got the charcoal burner. Now, this cap coloration that you see here is incredibly variable on this species of mushroom. I've seen them practically white, green, green and white, purple and a little bit greeny, so, <laughs> sometimes with little tinges of blue. Um, but there's one thing that remains the same with every charcoal burner, is that it is the only member of the Russula genus that doesn't have brittle gills. If you watch my, uh, I think it's my October mushroom foraging video, I find another Russula in that video, and you'll see the gills kind of snapping and looking a bit like flaked almonds in my hand. Um, and I do go through the ways to identify the safe mushrooms in that family, in that genus, in that video. Um, but with this one, it's nice and simple. If you know you've got a Russula, which I do by sight, but you kind of need to know your mushrooms a little bit before you start saying that's definitely a Russula, because even the death cat can look quite similar to members of the Russula family. Um, but when you've got one that has gills which are flexible and malleable and don't snap, they're not brittle, you know it's the charcoal burner, Russula cyanoxantha, uh, and it's reputed, and, and I agree, to be the tastiest member of the Russula family. So um, this one is definitely going in the foraging bag. So it's not all extreme foraging today. We've got um, another lovely group of chanterelles right by the path. This one's been a little bit nibbled. These ones are quite young and got exposed to the sunshine. So that's why they've lightened up, got a little bit paler. There's some more over here that have done the same. Big one here. A couple there. All a little bit munched, but I have no problem in picking a chanterelle if it's been a, a tiny bit munched by a slug. 
I obviously would take the slug off before putting it in my food though. Uh, and over here we've got some real crackers. Is that in the way? And there's some more dotted over there, and some down here. So a really lovely little patch and some youngsters. Now, when I find a spot like this, we are right beside the path, as you can see here, and uh, you can be pretty sure that someone else might see them, and also that dogs and other people might walk on this part of, uh, of the pathway and either pick or ruin your chanterelles. So a little forager's trick, I know exactly where this spot is. And what I'm gonna do is find the youngest ones and cover them up. <laughs> with a little bit of leaf litter. Trying hard not to tread on any babies. There's some lovely babies. I'm gonna pick this one from the middle of that little patch. Oh, and I've just uncovered two more of a pickable size. Uh, so these are the kind of things I'm after. And I'm not bothered about them being slightly less yellow uh, than they can be. Um, these are going to taste absolutely wonderful and uh, I'm looking forward to eating them. The rest, well all the little babies anyway, I'm going to stay here for a couple of minutes and cover up. <laughs> yeah. And bring you over here because I just want to show you something which is uh, this mushroom here. Come down look close and uh, to all intents and purposes, this looks like another russular mushroom, but it's not. So, like I said, when I found the first charcoal burner, you have to be totally sure that you have a russula um, before you start even thinking about having a nibble of it. Um, just to show you, this looks very much like a russula, that stout white stem, a reasonably, uh, well, it's brown, but a reasonably uh, evenly coloured cap. And I'll just lever him out the ground, though, instead of picking him. Show you a few extra features. Now, this is our blusher, which is an edible mushroom, okay? But it's in the Amanita family. It's not in, or Amanita genus. It's not in the Russula genus. And there's members of this genus are the most poisonous that we have in the UK. So the death cap and the destroying angel to name the, the two most famous uh, mushrooms. And the death cap in particular can look very much like this. So uh, if you're not sure of what you're doing, don't mess with the Russula family because this would be, if this was a death cap, a potentially fatal mistake to make. Um, the uh, way that I know it's a, a blusher is because we've got the bulbous base, rather than what you get with the death cap is more of a, a cup, a visible and obvious cup. As with the Amanitas, see that bulbous base. And what we can see there, if you look closely, is the remnants of the skirt on the stem. But it's almost entirely gone. And Lindsay, who's holding the camera, she spotted this mushroom and she's been foraging for a while. She knows what she's doing. And both of us, when we first saw it, thought, oh, there's another russula. But it's not. It's an edible member of probably the most dangerous family of mushrooms in the UK. There we go. Stay safe when you're foraging. If you are not 100% sure of what you're picking, be it a mushroom or a plant or even a fruit, just do not eat it. It is not worth risking your life for a little mushroom. Here's a, a lovely little baby. like a little white ball with a brown hat on. This is uh, a baby Somerset or Boletus reticulatus. Uh, at least I think that's what it is. We do also get the butter belete growing around here um, and until it's uh, a little bit bigger 
I'm not sure which of the two it is, but at the moment I'm going with 90% that it's our summer set. Either way, this is a little baby. We're not picking this one. Um, I might come back and pick him in a week or so if he's still here, but the slugs look like they've already found him. So we shall see. Uh, I've talked a lot about how mushrooms are good for trees and plants and your local ecosystem in the past. Um, there are a few though that are known as tree killers or, or parasitic mushrooms and we've got one down here and it's not one I uh, like to see. It infests oak trees normally but it's on a chestnut here. Um, it's called the spindle shank, Gymnopus fusipes and uh, you kind of get this red, almost bobbin shaped shank or stipe or stem, whatever you want to call it, on the mushroom. It's not an edible. When I say bobbin shaped, it just kind of gets a bit fatter in the middle of the stem. Not an edible. Um, and uh, I have read in one scientific paper that it can take out up to 75% of the root system of an oak tree, um, which is, uh, you know, it's all part of nature, but I don't like seeing it on my favorite oak trees at all. Anyway, onwards. And uh, this is unfortunately what those mushrooms that I was just talking about can do to a tree. You might remember this tree from my October mushroom video. Um, this is the tree that was covered in honey fungus just what, seven months ago. And you can see this, uh, there's some glistening ink caps growing out of it just there. Done a whole nother video on glistening ink caps and they're certainly not worthy of the bag when the bag's full of chanterelles but they are inedible. Um, but if you have a look here, look at what the mushrooms have done to the inside of this beautiful beech tree. Hollowed it out. And under here, I think, we've still got the evidence. The boot laces of our honey fungus. I think it was Armillaria malaya that was on this tree. And uh, the honey funguses get called bootlace fungus because you can see these um, what are called rhizomorphs underneath the bark of the trees that it's infecting. And uh, it can spread using these across underground as well. So honey fungus is a very vigorous mushroom and uh, it does make me fear for a few of the other trees around here. Um, but it's one of nature's recyclers. You know, this tree is going to get turned back into compost and hopefully more trees will grow. And uh, here's the mushroom that I'm going to finish up on today because I've got a nice bag of chicken of the woods and charcoal burners and, uh, and chanterelles, big enough for me. Um, but down here is one that I can't leave behind, so come on down and take a closer look. Here we have my first summer sep of the year, Boletus reticulatus. If I get that grass out of the way, you might get a better look. Um, very nicely framed in the moss by our blackberries there. Here it is. They're kind of little brother of our penny bun, as far as I'm concerned. This grows earlier in the year, so the chanterelles that we were uh, looking at earlier on, they come up um, in this spot around the middle of May normally, depending on the weather. Uh, this, the, the summer set, Boletus reticulatus, around here comes up around the middle of June, and it will go through summer uh, when there's decent rain so I'll come back up to this spot uh, about four or five days after every decent little bit of rain and hopefully through June, July and August find plenty of these mushrooms. Now just to run through its ID features quickly it's uh, in the wider Belitali family. Mycologists will um, tell you that that's actually something like 27 different genuses of, of mushroom but for us foragers, all we need to know, sponge under the cap, 
And then that old rule, no red, no blue. If there's any red on the outside, uh, or if it stains blue when you cut it in half, then uh, leave it behind as a novice forager. Wait until you really know what you're doing because the only poisonous ones in the UK that have sponge under the cap will have red either on the sponge or around the stem and they'll stain a little bit blue in the flesh when you cut them in half. Watch my video on the devil's belief for exactly those details. Um, so, or the Satan's belief rather, not the devil's belief. Um, so here we've got the summer set. It's differentiated from the Belita sedulus, the true penny bun, by the fact that the cap is always matte. Whereas on our penny buns, cap shiny. They both have what's called white reticulation on the stem. Now this will be hard for the camera to pick up, but you'll see a sort of white netting, particularly towards the, the top of the stem. On all of the edulous clade or the, the penny bung clade, if you like, um, this one, the Somerset, can get quite tall. Um, it will in almost every way resemble the, the normal edulous. The, the pores on this are normally white. This one's slightly discolored yellow, but that'll happen on the edulous, the, the true penny bun as well. The slugs love them. And uh, that's what all of these holes around here are down to. What I want to find out now is how much of this the maggots have enjoyed. Now, that's all I do when I'm checking my mushrooms for maggots. I chop the base of the stem, and if there's no holes around, little round holes, then you've generally got a maggot-free mushroom. You don't have to do that with the chanterelles, because they just don't get maggots, they have an insecticide, as does the babyletus in this uh, genus of mushrooms. But just to prove that, I'll now cut the cap. And you can see there, no insect life at the top. But you can discern that, like I say, just by cutting the stem because the maggots seem to start at the base of the stem and work their way up the mushroom. So here we go. The summer set, chicken of the woods, charcoal burners, and some lovely chanterelles. We found so many mushrooms today of a really high edible class that we even left the Dryad saddle behind. That's one of my favorites too though. Um, now it's off to go and cook some of these mushrooms. Right, so it's a day after I collected the chanterelles and I'm finally getting a chance to, uh, to pickle them. And the first step for pickling them is to give them a decent wash. Oh, well, I suppose the first step is to select the right size. So come and have a closer look. Uh, these are sort of, to me, perfect size for pickling. But I had collected a few bigger ones. So cut those in half. And to me, just about that. Exact size is perfect. Now, uh, I wouldn't recommend this with mushrooms normally um, because mushrooms are porous and if you wash them, uh, they're gonna take in that water become a bit less mushroomy, a bit more watery, but I really want to try and get rid of any grit, any bits of leaf litter. Anything that isn't chanterelle, if I can. But I don't want to overdo it. I did give them a good, a good uh, clean in the field, as you saw. Now, what I'm going to do now, after washing them, is just spread them out on here. Oops. That will do. Lovely chanterelles. And I'm going to put them in here. This is my dehydrator, and I'm just gonna pop them in on, let's see, 60 degrees for an hour. 
and we'll see what they're like after that um, because uh, for pickling you want your mushrooms to, to be able to soak in the, the pickling liquor, whatever you're using, to make them just that little bit extra tasty. And by dehydrating them a little bit, you'll uh, allow them to just absorb more of your pickling liquor. So that's what's going on here. I will check them. Um, it's not an exact science because your mushrooms are always in a slightly different state when you get them out of the field. So uh, sometimes if it's been raining, they're gonna be really moist. Other times, if it's sunny, clearly they're gonna be drier. So you need to kind of almost do it by eye. And if you haven't got a dehydrator, an oven, or just a, a dry frying pan on really low will work just as well. So I'm gonna come back and check my chanterelles in half an hour, or maybe a little bit more, just to make sure they're okay. And uh, when they get dry enough, that's when we can start the pickling process. So uh, while the uh, chanterelles are dehydrating, I'm just gonna pick another one of the ingredients for, for the pickling uh, from my garden. It is a plant that you can find in the wild, but I guarantee you, if you've got a garden, you've got it somewhere, infesting your, uh, your flower beds or your vegetable patches. And uh, it's this plant here, a lovely wood haven. I often say to people, the way to identify it is that it looks like a strawberry, but unlike a strawberry, you get these opposing leaves running down the stem. And uh, that's the basal growth. That'll grow in a rosette. And it'll be there most of the year. In fact, all year round. And uh, a few times a year, it'll flower. Chuck up this uh, flowering stem. And you can see there's one of its lovely little yellow flowers. And they drop and they turn into these rather non-sticky burrs. Nothing like your burdock or sticky willies. But they do get around. They infest every single bit of ground that they get to. And uh, what I'm after is quite simple. Oops, didn't get much of that one. But with your wood havens, there's always plenty to spare. That was rather poor, but these are the roots. I was hoping to get a little bit more. I will collect a few more, um, but uh, I will use what I've got there once I've cleaned it off in the pickling liquor as a clove substitute. So they've got exactly the same chemical in as cloves and they have exactly the same flavor as cloves, but milder. So they're they're better than cloves, if you ask me, because cloves can overpower your cooking. Uh, whereas these, being just that little bit milder, are a little bit more forgiving. Either way, in your uh, pickling liquor, um, these are something that go very, very nicely. Let's get a few more, though. bit better. Well, not much. <laughs> Still, I'm weeding the garden and uh, picking things for my dinner at the same time. Right, let's go and use these. Right, I've just come to the other side of the garden to get another uh, one of the ingredients we need for the pickle. We've got an audience here. The chickens are watching our every move. Um, here's the other ingredient I'm talking about. This is our hogweed. If you're familiar with my videos, you're probably familiar with hogweed. And uh, what I'm taking is just some of these young seeds. This is going to be quite an experimental pickle. Uh, going to give these a good wash because there's a bit of white fly on them. But those young seeds have a, a taste reasonably akin to coriander um, and they're nice and woody that's what you want in a pickling sauce in a pickling liquor um, so yeah i'm gonna give these a try in our pickling liquor today and see how they get on 
Okay, now I'm uh, ready to start my pickling process. And uh, pickling, nice and simple, is basically steeping things in vinegar. Uh, but your first choice when you're uh, deciding to, to make a pickle is whether you're going to have to use a hot or cold pickle. Um, because we're using mushrooms, and whenever I'm pickling mushrooms, I use a hot pickle, so they get a bit of cooking, you know, above 80 degrees, just to kill any bacteria that might be in there. Um, when you're pickling uh, things that don't need to be cooked, then you can use a cold pickle, no problem whatsoever. Loads of things go great in a pickle. Even last year I was introduced to pickled magnolia buds. They are fantastic, but they're not quite as nice as uh, pickled chanterelles. So I'll show you what I'm gonna do today. It's a bit of an experimental one. Here I've got just toasting off those hogweed seeds and some peppercorns, about a tablespoon of peppercorns. And I've left the hogweed seeds attached to their stems just um, because I want to taste them at the end of pickling to see what they're like. I know they're gonna add a nice flavor, but the seeds themselves might not be quite so nice. So um, that will just make them easier to remove if I decide to at the end. Like I said, this is a bit of an experimental one. Um, peppercorns. They're not an experimental ingredient, and uh, I think they're all toasted off enough. Um, they go into most of my pickles, as does lots of garlic. Now, the reason for that is that I love pickled garlic. It adds a nice flavour to the pickle, and uh, I'll happily munch the garlic cloves as well. So I'll put in more garlic cloves than most people into my pickles. And I'm gonna put in three big chunks of ginger, They'll probably get fished out at the end. Um, I can't imagine that they'll taste too nice, but we'll see, someone might like them. A couple of bay leaves from the garden. Uh, a sprig of thyme from the garden. Well, there's two or three different types of thyme in there, actually. And uh, some rosemary, all of which I'm leaving whole, plus my woodhaven roots. Nicely cleaned off. Uh, that is part of the plant, all that dark stuff there. I've got rid of all the mud and they can go in there now. Just let all of that toast off behind it. This is the hot side of the agar and uh, that's what I want for toasting things off. And uh, for the actual side, well, for the vinegar that I'm going to use, it's uh, one of the choices you make when you're making a pickle. Do you use white wine vinegar or today I'm going to use cider vinegar. Um, I like sweet pickled chanterelles and cider vinegar is just that little bit sweeter than white wine vinegar. So it suits, uh, suits me. And today I've got Willie's organic apple cider vinegar, uh, raw and unpasteurized, which does mean that this pickle, if I was to leave it, would have a shorter shelf life than, uh, than if I was to use other more processed vinegars, but that's fine by me because these won't last very long. And I can hear that starting to sizzle a tiny bit, which means we're getting rid of the last bit of moisture there. And now I'm gonna steep the cider, basically. This is a, a litre bottle, probably one at least 500 ml to cover my chanterelles. That's roughly half the bottle. And I'm going to put in, uh, just to top it up, about 250 ml of water. Just a spoon. a little mix but basically just leave it on here now the agar is not particularly hot this is not like a, a, a gas hob on full flame this is nowhere near that hot if you're using a, a different electric oven or an electric hob then you're probably wanting a sort of middle of the range heat just to steep the vinegar slowly and bring it up to the boil that will take a couple of minutes so at that point, we'll be um, doing the next step. So, next stage, nice and simple. We've got our pickling liquor here, which has been steeping for about 15 minutes. It's uh, come to the boil, and I just took it off the heat for a second and put it back on. And there you can see 
what it looks like. It's quite cloudy because I've used a cloudy-ish vinegar. Uh, what I didn't add when I was putting the liquor together was a little teaspoon of uh, sea salt. Put that in. And then what I'm going to do is add my chanterelles. Now, these did take the full hour in the uh, dehydrator to get to how I want them, and they're like that now. And that's basically when the edges of the caps are just a bit dry to the touch. The rest of the mushroom still got a reasonable amount of its own uh, juices in there. And what I'm going to do is just quite simply put these in Make sure that I've got enough liquor in there to cover however many I put in. I can get a few more in there. The more the merrier. And I'm gonna put these last ones in. That one, just so you know, that one's dried out just a tiny bit too much for my liking but it can go in nonetheless and they're just about covered. And a tiny bit more of the, uh, the vinegar, just to make sure. And the, uh, the pickling liquor, the vinegar is reusable, so I don't mind making a bit too much of it when I know I can go back to my chanterelle patch and pick a few more chanterelles over the next few days. Now, this side of the arga is quite a low heat and uh, that vinegar would boil if I left the top fully on. But I'm going to leave the top just off ever so slightly because there's plenty of liquor in there and if it evaporates a little bit then that's not a problem. Um, I will just say now though, bear in mind I've uh, rushed through a few things in this video like the identification of the hogweed and the identification of the chanterelles. Both of those plants or both of those uh, things have dangerous lookalikes in the UK. So before you start picking those, please check my identification videos on both the chanterelle and hogweed. They both have dangerous lookalikes. So make sure you know what you're picking before you start doing this. Anyway, now what I'm gonna do is leave that there on the low, low heat for about half an hour and take it off. And they'll be, they'll be ready then, but what I'm gonna do is then put them in a jar and leave them overnight and we'll see what the people in the office think of them tomorrow. Right, well, I was hoping that by using the really lovely sweet cider vinegar I wasn't going to have to do this, but I've just had a little taste of the uh, pickle vinegar and it's not quite as sweet as I would like it. So I am going to add a couple of tablespoons of sugar now. Hoping I wouldn't have to. But to me, it's more important that we get some very tasty pickled chanterelles at the end. Um, now, that is something you'll find in most recipes. And now you can add it to this one too. Uh, they still need the, mm, another 20 minutes or so uh, before I'm happy to take them off the heat. Uh, but we're nearly there. Uh, right, we're ready to jar up our lovely pickled chanterelles. Here they are. Just get a little spoon. Have a little taste of that. Pickling liquor. Mmm. Yeah, that's really nice. I did add another tablespoonful of the sugar, I must admit, but it's worked out quite nicely. Um, so now I'm just going to transfer this into a jar and I'm going to remove certain bits as we go, but First thing I want to do is find some of those hogweed seeds. There we go. Yeah, 
yeah, they're not bad. They're a nice little side spice addition, uh, sort of addition to, to what we've got here. Yeah, they've still held a, a slight coriander taste to them. Just going to get rid of some of the bigger stuff as we go along. Oh, this is quite heady. The whole kitchen is filled with the uh, aroma of the, of the lovely pickling liquor at the moment. And having your face over this bowl is quite eye-watering, I must say. I think we've picked Slightly too big jar pops, but as long as I can get the liquor to cover the mushrooms, there we go. let's not forget our garlic plate. And now I just want to try and leave behind. Any more of those big woody things that I don't want. And there we go. It's actually quite murky looking, but maybe if we hold it up to the light, <laughs> you'll see our pickled chanterelles. Yeah, that vinegar certainly has made these cloudy, but they'll definitely be tasty. Right, I'm just going to leave these overnight now to cool and steep together. And then uh, when I'm serving them, they either just come out in the jar or I'll uh, just dry them off by fishing them out and putting them on a, a bit of kitchen roll for a minute or two before serving them on people's plates. There you go. Enter the Wild Food UK office. And like, <laughs> like every good office, we have a dining room table here, and uh, this is Pops and Lindsay, and Jess is currently holding the camera, and this is a little impromptu lunch for you. I really want you to try these pickled chanterelles and let me know what you think. But come over here, these are the pickled chanterelles, how they've ended up with the garlic in there. And uh, what I've done with them is just some boiled eggs, some cheese, and there's some tomatoes. But the salad here is all foraged. This is chickweed, mallow flowers, some lime leaves, and uh, some other bits and bobs from around the garden. And uh, now we get to see if, <laughs> if the office think that my pickled chanterelles are as tasty as I do. I have. <laughs> uh, right, your cheeses choices there are, there's a Santa Girl, which is uh, a bit bluish and a bit creamy, and then there's uh, a Hereford Hop, which is a lovely local cheese, a little bit mild, and then here we've got a lovely crystally cheddar, which uh, is coastal mature cheddar, which we get um, in a shop just up the road, which I love, and I just wanted to see which, which cheeses these lovely mushrooms go best with. So please all dive in, don't be shy. Jump up, Jess, if you need to. Now, this is an unusual thing. Getting Poppy to eat any of our foraged food has always been difficult. But... That's why you got my favorite cheese. <laughs> so here we go. Are you ready to taste? Has everyone got some mushrooms? Yeah. Oh, cheese. <laughs> okay, now I want you all to be honest, and all of a sudden I feel like I'm on Master Chef. This is quite daunting. Um, so go on, jump in. Mm. Lovely crunching oh, wow. noises. That's really good. Mm. Yeah? Really? <laughs> really good. No, it's really good. Even I like them. Oh. 
Are you sure, Pops? With the cheese, yeah. Yeah? With the cheese? Well, yeah. I'm Can I see you eat one on its own? You Just to prove it. <laughs> oh, really? Without coughing. Better with the cheese. <laughs> well, there's nothing like honesty. Um, are they good? Do you like them? Yeah, they're good. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Mm, very nice. A bit too you. vinegary, maybe? No. No, they're a pickle. They're supposed to be. Good. Very good. Good. I'm glad you like them. Yeah. It's such a modern thing. You've always got to take photos of your food nowadays. <laughs> it's so yummy. Instagram. Here we come. <laughs> All right, well. It looks like the pickled chanterelles were a success and the salad. I already knew that people would like, um, so I think it's about time I had some for myself. Right, hurry up, 10 minutes and you're back to work.